In this video, we're going to talk about definite integrals. A central concept in Calculus 2 is to graph a function and find the area in between the function and the x-axis. This is the concept that we're going to be exploring today. Now, since we're doing areas, you might have the question, haven't we done this before? I find areas of things, circles and squares and triangles. We have area formulas for those. So what's new? Say if I were to graph e to the x, that will be our first example on the next slide. e to the x is not a basic triangle. It's not a basic rectangle. So we're gonna have to find other methods to find the area under the curve. The method that we're going to focus on in this video is called Riemann sums. The basic idea for a Riemann sum is that we're going to take the area in question, break it down into a bunch of rectangles, and then add up the areas of the rectangles. One of the most important things to remember about a Riemann sum is that it's not exact. If e to the x is not a triangle or a rectangle or a basic shape, then a Riemann sum of breaking it up into a bunch of tiny little rectangles is just an estimation of the actual area under the curve. So don't forget that. Riemann sums are an estimation of the area under the curve. Another detail to keep in mind about this video is that in Calculus 2, areas can be negative. We use the terminology net area in order to indicate that sometimes the area could be positive if it's above the x-axis or negative if it's below the x-axis. If you've got a little bit of positive and negative area above and below the x-axis, then you need to add that up and see what you get. Well, if I had more positive area and just a little bit of negative area, overall the net area would be positive. It could be the other way around. I have a little bit of positive area above the x-axis and a large portion of negative area below the x-axis. In this case, when I add up the two portions, I will get overall a net area that is negative. And finally, a special case. What if you had exactly the same amount of area above and below the x-axis? In this case, the net area could end up being zero. These are the concepts we're going to explore in this video. Let's begin with some terminology. Today we're gonna to be talking about definite integrals. Here are the symbols that we use for definite integrals. You can see the familiar squiggly line. And what's different about this notation is that here we have an x value, x equals a and x equals b on the bottom and the top of the integral sign. The meaning of these symbols is the net area between the x-axis and the graph of the function f of x from x equals a to x equals b. Suppose we had a graph of a function like like the following. Now the value of this integral according to this graph would be the total area between the function and the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. As you can see in this rough picture there is more area above the x-axis than there is below the x-axis. So I can immediately tell that the value of the definite integral for this picture at least is positive because the area above the x-axis is getting counted as positive and the area below the x-axis is getting counted as negative. It's important to distinguish definite integrals from indefinite integrals in terms of terminology. Indefinite integrals are what we did last time. They are simply antiderivatives. We did these types of integrals last time, and of course we'll do more later. The important thing to remember at this stage is that indefinite integrals do not have a or b on the bottom and the top of the integral sign. Indefinite integrals are sort of a symbolic computation. You just kind of think about derivatives and try to do derivatives backwards like we did in the previous video. Of course, not forgetting to add plus c. What we're doing today is an entirely different process. We are drawing functions, shading in regions, figuring out positive area and negative area and adding it up. The key indicator that you're supposed to be drawing a graph and thinking about areas is that there's a number on the bottom of the integral sign and a number on the top of the integral sign. As we move along in this course, we'll start to understand better why such similar symbols are used for two totally different ideas. Now I'm going to show you how to do a Riemann sum using an example. We're going to estimate the area in between the x-axis and the e to the minus x function from x equals 0 to x equals 5, and we're going to use a specific method that's called the left-handed Riemann sum with 10 rectangles. We need to begin by drawing a graph. First, let's remember how to graph e to the x. Now, this is not the function that we have in our problem. We have e to the negative x. 
Do you remember what happens to a graph when you replace x by negative x? What it does is it flips the graph from left to right, so the graph of e to the negative x looks something like this. Of course, they both intersect at 0, 1. Since e to the minus x is the graph in question, I'm just going to keep the red graph. Now, the area we're looking to estimate is the area in between the function and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 5. This line is not a straight line. So the area we're looking for in here is not just a triangle because the line on the top is not straight. So the Riemann sum will allow us to estimate the area under the curve. What we're going to do is divide the x-axis into 10 evenly spaced pieces. Now these smaller intervals have a length equal to a total of 5 divided by 10. 5 divided by 10 is a half. So the first tick mark here is a half. The next interval is also length a half. So the next tick mark must must be 1. Following this logic, we get the value of each tick mark. Each of these smaller subintervals is the bottom of a rectangle. Here's the bottom of rectangle number 1 and the bottom of rectangle number 2 in the second interval. In this example, we are asked to estimate the area using a left-handed Riemann sum. What this means is that each rectangle, the height will be equal to the height of the function at the left-handed endpoint of the interval. 0 is the left-handed x value for the the first interval. So whatever the height of the function is at x equals 0, that will be the height of the rectangle over the first interval. For interval number 2, the left-handed x value is 0 0.5. The height of the function at 0 0.5 will be the height of the rectangle over the second interval. Proceeding in this manner, we obtain a rectangle over each and every sub-interval. There are 10 sub-intervals, so there are 10 rectangles, and that was given to us in the problem when it said n equals 10. Okay, now let's put in the hard work and add all of this stuff up. The area of rectangle number 1 is the width times the height. The width is 0 0.5 and the height of the first rectangle is, so e to the minus 0 is equal to 1 and the height of the first rectangle is 1. Rectangle number 2, the width is still a half and the height is equal to the height of the function at the left endpoint. e raised to the negative 0 0.5 power. That's the height of the second rectangle. I hope you can see the pattern. Let's move on to the third rectangle, fourth and fifth rectangles, and the rest of the rectangles. Now we will need a calculator in order to add this up. The area given by the blue rectangles is approximately equal to 1.26. As you can see, the blue rectangles are slightly above the function we were interested in. So our answer here is an overestimate of the value of the definite integral. Notice that when we're doing a left-handed Riemann sum, all of the left-handed endpoints of the intervals get used. Here that was 0, 0 0.5, 1, and then we got to the last interval, and the final left endpoint was 4.5. Notice that in a left-handed Riemann sum, the final endpoint of 5 never gets used. We had no term in here that was e to the minus 5 power. Check it out. How would the problem change if I did a right-handed Riemann sum for the exact same problem? We already have our subdivisions in place. We're still going to use 10 rectangles, so I still have a total length of 5 divided into 10 intervals. So these intervals are still the same. But now the height of the rectangle is not supposed to be on the left endpoint. It should be on the right endpoint. So our rectangles change. The first rectangle for a right-handed Riemann sum will look more like this. On the second interval, the right-handed x value is 1. So the height of the function at the right-handed x value will be equal to the height of the rectangle. Let's take a look at rectangle number 1. It still has a width of 0 0.5, but now the height is no longer e to the 0, e to the minus 0 0.5. That's the height of the first rectangle from the right-handed endpoint. So for the right-handed Riemann sum, the first term just completely goes away. e to the 0 power is no longer being used, and rectangle number 1 has a height of e to the minus 0 0.5. Rectangle number 2 is e to the minus 1. Rectangle number 3 has a height of e to the minus 1.5. Because we're using the right endpoint for each one of the intervals, by the time we get to the end, and now the rightmost endpoint needs to be included because it is the height of the last rectangle. So here it's now included. The final value for the right-handed Riemann sum is the area of all of these pink and white rectangles. We obtain a 
approximately 0.77. As you can see from the picture, the pink and white rectangles, the right Riemann sum, is an underestimate of the actual area under the curve. The actual value of the area between the x-axis and the function e to the minus x, we don't know. But we know approximately its value somewhere in between 0.77 and 1.26. When the function is decreasing, the right-handed endpoint goes underneath the function, and the left-handed endpoint goes over the function. Now suppose I was in a different scenario, and the function is increasing from a to b, and we want this area. Will a right Riemann sum be an overestimate or an underestimate or neither. Let's draw some tick marks and think it through. Using the right-handed endpoints, you can see that these are going above the function. It's an overestimate. Now what if we had a function that was increasing and decreasing in between a and b? And we're going to draw a right-handed Riemann sum and the final rectangles. It's really not clear. Part of it's an underestimate, but then the other part is an overestimate, so this is neither an overestimate nor an underestimate. Remember that each picture needs to be evaluated based on its own merits in order to figure out whether something is indeed an overestimate or an underestimate. The next type of Riemann sum is called a midpoint Riemann sum. Now this is for the function sine of 2 pi x. As usual, we're looking at the graph of sine of 2 pi x, and we want the area in between the function and the x-axis. So we must remember how to graph the function. Remember that one full period of the sine function means that the stuff getting plugged into the sine has to be equal to 2 pi. Setting 2 pi x equal to 2 pi will tell us how many x values give us a single oscillation. As you can see, this corresponds to x equals 1. Then we have a half in the middle here. In this problem, we're looking for the area in between the function and the x-axis, but from x equals a half up to 1.25. Now we're going to subdivide the region from x equals half up to x equals 1.25 into three evenly spaced rectangles. What's the total distance between a half and 1.25? The total length here is 0.75 or 3 fourths. We're going to divide that into three pieces so each subinterval has length 1 fourth. Let's label this carefully. So I'm going to take this half, the leftmost, and add a fourth to it. That'll give me 3 fourths. Adding 1 fourth to that brings me up to 1 and adding 1 fourth to that brings me up to 1.25. If you're having trouble with these fractions, I expect that you will take the initiative to write it out for yourself and prove it to yourself. So here we've got interval number 1, interval number 2, and interval number 3. This type of Riemann sum is a midpoint Riemann sum. How do we do it? Each interval, we need to identify what is the midpoint. What is the x value that is in between a half and three-fourths? I need to take a half and add an eighth. I get five-eighths for the midpoint. Let's move on to interval number two. I need to identify what is the x value of the middle of this interval. I'm going to take three-fourths and add an eighth. And now in interval number three, in between one and 1.25, what's the middle of that? You got it, one plus an eighth. If you don't know where these numbers are coming from, replay the video, rewind, listen to it again, and pay attention to how big the spacing is. As you can see, I redrew the picture because it was getting a little messy. In this class, I always expect that you will take the initiative and clean things up when it's getting messy. And the midpoint, I marked it with an X this time to make it super clear. Now, finally, for drawing the rectangles. For the midpoint Riemann sum, the height of the function at this midpoint will be equal to the height of the rectangle for this whole first interval. Moving on to the next interval. Again, the height of the function at the midpoint will be equal to the height of the rectangle for the second interval. And finally, the third. The height of the function at the midpoint will be the height of this rectangle for the third interval. As you can see from this picture, it's difficult for us to tell whether this will be an overestimate or an underestimate. It's sort of overestimate in some places, underestimate in other places. 
places. So based on this picture, this will be neither an overestimate nor an underestimate. All right, let's get to work adding this up. The width of the first rectangle is what? You got it, it's a fourth. What is the height of this first rectangle? How is the first rectangle obtained? You take the number 5 eighths and plug it into the function. So sine of 2 pi with 5 eighths plugged in for the x value. That is the height of the first rectangle. By the way, you can see from the picture that after you plug it into the sine function, it will be a negative number. So this height is actually a negative height. It already has a negative sign built into it because when you plug it into the function, it will be a negative number as we can see from the picture. Let's move on to rectangle number two. Again, the width is a fourth still, and the height of rectangle number two, again, this one will be negative, and we obtain that negative number by plugging seven eighths into the function. And finally, moving on to rectangle number three. The width is a fourth, and the height is obtained by plugging nine eighths into the function. Okay, now we gotta add this stuff up using a calculator. We obtain approximately negative 0.18. Does that make sense based on this picture that the total area is approximately a negative number? Yeah, that actually makes sense in this picture because as you can see, there's more area below the x-axis in comparison to above the x-axis. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed doing some Riemann sums. Although they are a bit of a tedious process, it's important to remember that Riemann sums are very basic. You just mark up the x-axis, mark up the heights of the rectangles, and then just add up the areas of a bunch of rectangles. This is an exercise that you don't need a lot of mathematical skill in order to perform. You do need to be able to graph functions. You have to be able to add things up. But the important thing to remember about Riemann sums is that they are a very basic but tedious exercise. So check out more problems in the homework and challenge yourself to go in the book, be independent and go in the book and find problems on your own. And don't forget to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. The most important questions that you have in this course can be resolved by talking to me individually. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Often it's the questions that you're afraid to ask that are the most important ones for you to resolve in this class. So don't hold yourself back. Talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, participate in the course, and don't forget to revisit the book daily.